Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Schuler Auditorium. Before we begin, we ask that you please turn your cell phones or pagers off at this time. Thank you. And now, will you please welcome Ken Pello. Good evening. It's always a, a great pleasure to be here at the, the annual Popcorn Forums. Our distinguished guest speaker this evening is an Associate Vice President for Diversity at Gonzaga University in Spokane. His credentials include an undergraduate degree in psychology from Eastern Washington University, a master's degree in public administration from City University of New York, Bernard Baruch College of Business, and he has just recently uh, completed his doctoral degree in leadership studies. Dr. Reyes is past chief administrative officer for the Coeur d'Alene tribe, was the administrative officer for the American Indian community uh, in Spokane. As a Native American, Mr. Reyes has spent many years working towards better cross-cultural communications. Besides serving in a number of service organizations, he has developed nearly 100 publications and presentations since 1982. He has 20 years of teaching experience in Native American education. Mr. Reyes is always in demand for workshops and presentations, and I know his calendar is full almost daily throughout the year. In case you'd like to uh, have him as a, uh, a speaker, it would be best to contact him at least a year prior to the date you'd like to book him. We are indeed blessed and fortunate to have his eloquent voice connect us and teach us of our past and heritage, to have his voice of wisdom make the present relevant to us, and to have his voice of vision provide us hope for a better future. It is a great honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker this evening. Please welcome Mr. Raymond Reyes. Come on, this isn't church, so come up forward a little bit. You don't have to sit way back there. I'm a, a time traveler. I'm one of those uh, people who will listen to the radio. Do you do this? You ever listen to the radio and you hear a song and it kind of takes you back to that time when that song was around, whether it was 20 years ago or 10 years ago? And just kind of thinking about where you were a year ago or 20 years ago, this sort of thing. And I was thinking about as recent as a month ago where I was. In fact, to the very day, uh, the 25th of February also lands on a Tuesday. And uh, I was doing a, a parting words lecture series at Gonzaga University. And the idea is uh, the student body wanting to have uh, people like myself or Father Spitzer and others speak to the graduating class and undergraduates about if we had one hour left to live, what would be our parting words? And, and so we talked for an hour. And I did that. And they advertised it. It was an interesting advertising with what would he say and this sort of thing. But what happened was um, people would come up to me and ask me, are you dying of a terminal disease? Uh, did you get fired? Uh, are you leaving the area for a better job? And it was, it was interesting to see people actually care. You know, unlike most humanoids, um, I'm culturally deprived. I don't watch TV that much. And uh, I've recently, this past year, found out that there's some TV program called Everybody Loves Raymond. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it was through the parting words lecture, I, I realized that some people do care about this Raymond, which, which was nice. And, a little bit of what I want to talk about tonight is, is, is about caring as a form of love. Um, yesterday morning, maybe some of you had the opportunity to hear Father Spitzer um, examine the phenomenology of love as a way of understanding uh, the epistemology of hate. And uh, in other words, if, if hate is simply defined as absence of love, uh, then to understand hate or the nature of hate, one must understand what is absent. And, and so 
in essence, I want to take off a little bit on what, what he had talked about. Stand up right where you are. Just, I know some of you have just finished eating, and I just want you to stand up. Because I, what I want to do is, is suggest something to you, and it might be trite and, and trivial, but I think it's true. And that is that some tribal people believe and practice uh, uh, that human beings have the ability, and I would even say the responsibility, to sing the world into being. And um, so let's sing the world into being right now. Because I actually believe that the Beatles, they were right. All you need is love. So if I can sing, anybody can sing. Because I have a Neil Young voice, and I'm a wannabe musician. I'm one of those guys that, you know, hangs out at open mic night and wish that I could get up in front. I'm a wannabe musician and also an actor, see? So I, wanna, I want you to sing along with me. So I, and, and also, uh, right here, everyone on this side face your relatives over here, and everybody on this side face your relatives over here. Come on, it, it doesn't hurt. Get the starch out of your underwear. Okay, here we go. All you need is love. All you need is love. Love is all you need. Let's try it again. Several, uh, well, a couple of years ago when the Lord of the Rings uh, movie first came out, I was driving home with two of my older children at that time, eight and ten. And we're, we were being uh, movie uh, critics and discussing the movie. And, you know, I asked them, I said, well, Frodo, is that his name? The, the, one of the characters I said, uh, why, why was he able to uh, wear the ring with no ill effect? You know, and Grace, at eight years, says... Uh, Daddy, because he had a pure heart. And I, I want to know, I want to think out loud with you tonight, what does it take to have a pure heart? Because I, I, but I, I think that the answer to the question, what does it take to have a pure heart, is experiencing spirituality as an antidote to hate. And so before I do that, I want to kind of frame this idea that says, well, where is the pure heart located? Not only what does it take to have a pure heart, but just kind of get a sense of its parameters, its, its anatomy, how, how it's constructed. And uh, years ago, there was an elder in uh, Macaw. His name is Emmett Oliver. And many years ago, uh, when I was starting to do public speaking, uh, he, he uh, saw me early in the morning eating breakfast by myself, and I was quite nervous. And he came up to me and started talking to me. And I guess it was his way of getting my, my attention off of what I was going to do. And so uh, he, he started telling me about the old days when he was a merchant marine. And uh, he started talking about how you're out in open space and the open water, and this is before technology had na sophisticated navigation systems and this sort of thing, and when one would navigate according to the stars. And he talked about this concept called the deducted reckoning. And what the DR, a deducted reckoning, is, is uh, when you b bake a big triangle uh, locating your where you are, and so in essence is uh, I am in one place, and then you reach, you identify a star as a reference point, and then you have the, the sacred geometry, the, the perfect line, the great surround, where that place is that the sky meets the water, the horizon. And so those three points make a, make a triangle, deducted reckoning. So the idea is that the more reference points you have, the small, you keep on making triangles, the smaller the triangle, the more precision you have with locating your, your true sighting in relationship to where you want to go. And his, his beloved, or the first star that he could always identify in, in, the, in the night sky was Capella. So he would identify her, and then arbitrarily where he is in relationship to the horizon. And then he would begin finding other stars and making smaller triangles until he could identify with some degree of precision where he was. I want to identify for you what I call five reference points, or what uh, others would call presuppositions, before I talk about what does it take to have a pure heart. Here again, understanding the epistemology of, of love to understand uh, hate, as we understand the desert and absence of water. 
The first, the first presupposition or the first reference point is this, and you've heard it before, is that God, creator, wonderful counselor, sweet whisper, divine imagination is love across all time and space and all cultures. The twin pillars of religious formation have always been and continue to be love and service. Put quite simply, God is love. To know love is to know God. Second reference point. Our emotional life is our spiritual report card. Houston Smith uh, once observed that reason is too short of a ladder to reach the lofty heights of truth. Truth surrounding sins of omission and sins of commission as it pertains to human difference is the province of the heart and not logic or reason. However, there is an inherent logic to our emotional intelligence and that is the third reference point in our quest to locate and describe the residence of the pure heart. So the third reference point is this. We either act on our feelings or we act them out. So in a sense, we're all very adolescent at times. If you remember your teenage years, you remember those teenage years? Yes, where you were a rebel without a cause and everyone was an existential philosopher asking those questions, who am I, why am I, what is the purpose of life? Do you remember that? The stormy times sitting in the fire of your own maturational experience? Well, John Bradshaw, he has often described the, the reconciliation of, of poisonous pedagogy or parenting by chanting his mantra, healing through feeling. What we cannot feel, we cannot heal. Human feeling is the wind beneath our spiritual wings that move us closer to the divine one. So healing through feeling, the idea that we act on our feelings or we act them out. The idea here again that our emotional life is our spiritual report card and that God is love. The fourth reference point is that human diversity, its nature, and our reaction to its nature is the living curriculum by which we spiritualize our consciousness to learn the lessons of love and service. So human diversity, its nature, and our reaction to that nature is this living curriculum that allows us to spiritualize our consciousness, consciousness being attitude and attention. And that it is, it is in the relationship with the other, whoever the other may be, that we define and authenticate our personhood. Fritz Perls, in fact, describes this curriculum in learning space as through the face of another I am. It is in relationship, I get a deeper, more profound sense of who I am. And then the fifth and final reference point for our discussion tonight, to locate this pure heart, which is the antidote to hate, is that culture, quite simply, is a way of life that allows us to walk the spiritual path with practical feet. So these five reference points are my presuppositions for this evening's reflection. And in fact, will also will become the basis for some questions I want to pose to you, and then I'll go into answering those questions. I don't know if how many of you have ever read James Hilton's book, uh, Lost Horizon. Do you, some of you remember that book? It was about uh, Changrela, a place in the Himalayas where people live forever. And uh, there, it's a, it was a musical, the one that was originally done um, in the 30s. And the musicals, uh, the, the one song in the musical was Question Me and Answer. Question Me and Answer. It's interesting that Saul Halinsky in Rules uh, for Radicals uh, talks about how the amused as he is, that the question mark looks like an inverted plow, breaking up the hard soil of old beliefs, preparing the ground for new growth and development. So here are the two questions that I want to pose tonight and investigate with you. How does one experience spirituality as an antidote to hate? And what does it take to have a pure heart? I really believe, and I don't know where I got this, and sometimes you've heard about original sin. I often wonder whether there's an original thought. It's a rationalization for uh, plagiarizing other people's genius and brilliance. But in any event, I, I don't know where I got this, but I, I would have liked to believe that I wrote it. But the idea that who we are today is God's gift to us and who we become is our gift to God. And how we RSVP the creator is how we experience spirituality as an antidote to hate. Let me say that again because I think it's foundational to my core message this evening. That how we RSVP the creator, that if we believe indeed 
that our life is a gift from God and that who we become is our gift back to God, that there's got to be some way of responding to the he, she, it of the infinite invisible and say, I heard you, I am here. And somehow, RSVP the creator. And that's what I want to talk about. And that's what I talked about last month. But I want to develop my thinking a little bit more. I want to sharpen that a little bit more. And I'm going to use your sensitivity and your sensibility, your gracious patience with me to do that. RSVP stands for what? Relationship, service, value, and passion. Relationship, service, value, and passion. To su establish, sustain, and nurture the space of the sacramental beholder called the pure heart. Let me explain. The R. The R in RSVP is for relationship. Relationship to self-love. It, it's real interesting uh, how I've spent a lot of my life uh, denying any goodness of fit with respect to this gift that I've been given. I want to remind you that yesterday when Father Spitzer spoke, he talked about the personal, the interpersonal, community, and societal dimensions of, of, of hate. And he also said, if you recall, that the place to be preemptive and, to, and address hate at its embryonic stages of development is in the, in the self, the person, the first level. And, and that is where I'm going to spend most of my evening when I talk about this RSVP, that R in the RSVP is relationship to self-love. A number of years ago, uh, when I finished my master's degree, I'd done research in California and came back to Spokane to, to work in the American Indian Community Center. And I got this wonderful place uh, up on South Hill. It's on your, the back way to Worley. And um, it was 10 acres, old farmhouse. The price was right. I just had moved in and um, also had uh, an, an experience with my kitty. His, his name was Hercules. And Hercules was a macho kitty. He had a club tail and he was an outdoor kitty and he got in a lot of fights. And right before, uh, right when we had moved in there, there was a barn and he had gotten in a fight with an owl, obviously, because he'd got his leg pretty well torn up. And uh, so I had a decision to make. Was I gonna uh, you know, have a three-legged kitty and have it amputated or have a high maintenance relationship, which I am not very good at, by the way, and, and uh, nurture him and doctor him and change his bandages and do all this stuff with him. And so I decided that I didn't want to have a three-legged kitty and that I would uh, take care of him and uh, he would live inside the house. And I hadn't put things away yet. Things were still in boxes and things were still um, in disarray. And I had this beautiful mahogany uh, mirror and it was propped up against the, the wall. And I remember the first time it happened, I was just sitting late at night by a wood stove reading and all of a sudden, I hear this sound. You know how cats hiss? You know, and looked over, and he was looking in the mirror, thinking there was another kitty in the mirror. And he was, he would be, you know, walking and looking and going, you know, and, and he, his back gets up with the hair and goes, you know, and he, you know, and he's, of course, he's a three-legged kitty, and he's doing this. You know, he's got one leg, and he keeps on looking at the mirror. And this went on, you know, a couple of days like that, you know, and... And then um, one evening, all of a sudden, he had a very loud purr. I mean, this brother had a purr. He had it going on. And, uh, you know, and one t I, I, all of a sudden, I saw him. I, he's purring. He's kind of stretched out, you know, like that, and looking over his shoulder at the mirror at the other kitty and waving at himself, you know, and, and looking like that and then looking away, you know. And, he had made friends with himself. <laughs> he, he had, he had a, a, a transformative experience with himself, and he actually had made friends with himself. Aren't we like that? Are you like that? I'm like that. I have a hard time believing that God loves me. Do you have a hard time believing that God loves me? I do. In fact, sometimes I work against that agenda and do things that aren't quite so healthy for me. So the core competency with this R and RSVP or relationship to self-love is that is with love present 
there is no fear. In the compost for hate is fear. Fear is the dark room where negatives are developed and the images and pictures of exclusion imbued with the emotion of hate. Martin Luther King, what people don't understand many times is that he was not a one song man, I had a dream speech. The deep roots of his activism was based on his notion of the beloved community. And the beloved community had three dimensions, a spiritual, social, and strategic. I don't have time, it's another course and another time to talk about the, the social and strategic, but in the spiritual, very much using the image, an image in Greek, the word means image, a moment's intuition into reality, is, a, is the image of a cross and saying its relationship with God love and relationship with self and relationship with others. And so he talked about three types of love, God, self, and the other. And the God love is having faith in one's connection to divine purpose, developing practices of prayer and ritual to for fully realize our purpose. God love focuses on the heights of love, whereas self-love focuses on the depths of love. Self-love is the development of our skills and talents and abilities, the grace that we all have. And then the other love is concerned with the breadth of love, our horizontal relationships with others. So the beloved community is possible if individuals are willing to do the difficult soul work necessary for spiritual transformation. This soul work consists of, God, of people's willingness to reorient and reprioritize their values, their senses of who we are, their purpose and their duties to God, self, and humanity. In other words, getting out of our comfort zones, being counter-cultural, counter-intuitive in our journey of going from the known to the unknown. Right now, just very quickly, fold your arms the way you normally fold your arms. Just like what you're doing. You're reminding you in the green. I mean, St. Patrick's Day a couple of weeks ago. Yes, indeed. Now, just note which arm is over which arm. In my case, my right one is over my left one. Let's switch your arms. Fold your hands like you're folding your hands. You're petitioning the Lord for prayer because you know you're a pitiful human being, and you're yet to really fully realize that God loves you indeed. In my case, my left thumb is over my right thumb. Let's switch your thumbs. So what words come to mind? What words come to mind when you, when you it, it describe the shift? Awkward, unnatural, odd, queer. You're a fat snake on a hot rock. What intrinsic or extrinsic motivation do you have to change? Think about the times you've had to change. Change in your health, relationships, divorce, falling in love, losing a job, starting a job in you, moving an apartment. Think about the, of a birth, a death. Think about the times in your life where you have been forced to look at who you are and invited to entertain the possibility that God loves you. Relationship to self-love invites us to experience the presence of spirit in our personhood. For example, the candor, with, with candor and precision, May uh, Carton, I don't know if you've read anything by her poet, she evokes the experience of spirit, or at least the description of my quest with being a spirit in earth body, having spiritual experience not the other way around, being a spiritual being, having spiritual experiences. But this is what, listen to what she says, because it speaks to me in terms of wh wh where, where is the, this R of relationship, relationship to, to self-love. Now I become myself. It's taken time, many years in many places. I have been dissolved and shaken, worn other people's faces. What a long time it can take to become the person one has always been. You ever get that feeling? How often in the process we mask ourselves in faces that are not our own. How much dissolving and shaking of ego, ego we must endure before we experience spirituality as an antidote to hate. To borrow the subtitle of Gandhi's autobiography, our lives are, quote, experiments with truth, unquote. Listening invites us to practice the truth. And as Angelus Arian once suggested, to tell the truth without blame or judgment. This is what it means to experience spirituality. The S in RSVP is for service through listening. 
I'm a wannabe uh, Indian, Hollywood Indian. I had a promising career at one point, believe it or not. I even almost got in a Honey Nut cereal commercial one time. <laughs> in 1990, I was asked by Cali Productions in Bellevue to audition for some roles in Northern Exposure. Do you remember that quirky little TV series, Northern Exposure? It was up in, in Alaska, and it, was, it had a, a moose in it, and, and um, do, you know, do you know what I'm talking about? In any event, I, they, some lady had seen me in a play, and I was in a couple of plays it, it, in 1986, 87, and 88 um, with the American Indian Community Center. We're doing some stuff on family of origin issues and some other things. But anyway, that's another lifetime, another story. But I, they said, uh, we want you to come in and audition for some roles in Northern Exposure, and we're gonna, we'll send you a plane ticket, and we'll pay you... Uh, a little nominal honorarium, and we'll have somebody pick you up at the airport, and we'll courier you over to Bellevue, and you're going to read three pieces, and then also there's an opportunity for some commercials, and then we'll get you back to Spokane all in one day. But I had to leave uh, early in the morning. This is a time we could get a 6 a.m. flight, maybe you still can, from Spokane to S Seattle. So I got the 6 a.m. flight and flew there and got there at 7, and sure enough, there was one of these people with little placket cards that said Reyes on it. And, you know, it's me, and we connected, and so she, she was pleased to affirm the good news, and the good news that I was scheduled for the auditions and everything was gonna go the way we thought. The bad news was, here it is 7 a.m. and my first audition isn't until two o'clock. <laughs> so I said, why did we come so early? And she says, well, you, we can take you over to my office and you can sit and use the telephone and hang out. I'm thinking to myself, for seven hours? <laughs> or you can go to a funeral. I said, well, I think to myself, funeral, office, aren't they the same thing? And so, so I, uh, I, I, I opt for the, for the funeral because, make a long story short, come to find out that it, it was a tragedy that, that she was going to a funeral for uh, her son who had come back from college. One of his friends had died in a car accident flying, uh, driving from Salt Lake City back to Seattle for the spring break. And they, have, they were having the funeral that morning. And so I went to the funeral. And so I, there I am, this huge funeral with all these people that I don't know, and I don't know that this, I don't know anybody. I just met this woman. So I'm sitting there in the back of the church with her on one side and her son on the other, and you know, I'm kind of going through this emotional roller coaster ride and getting connected with the sacred stories of the deceased and listening to uh, this person's journey, and you know, and uh, I find myself crying. I, I, I start Actually, I don't even know this person. I start crying, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm starting to sing my songs inside and pray, and, and and kind of filling myself up full of love, and you know, seeing myself as this star, this radiant source of energy, and giving it to the family because I could see how much they were in pain, and so I did all this, and then I went to the we ate and went to the studio, and I did my auditions. I didn't get the role. I was too tall and thin. They wanted somebody that was short and fat. I wanted straight hair, got curly hair. I wanted, you know, want to be short and I'm tall. You always want what you don't have, right? So then I auditioned for the, uh, I was going to audition for the uh, commercials and I didn't want it. I read the script and I thought it was pretty, uh, racist and crazy. It was the Honey Nut commercial with a bee going around. It was right before the quincentennial, you know, 1992. And I was going to be one of three Indians coming out of the, the brush and the, the Mayflower was going to come. It was really silly, you know. And I said, I, uh-uh, can't do that. So I didn't. Um, point being, sometimes, you know, and a friend of mine gave me this shirt um, in the front. It says, it's all about me. And I would like on the other side for it to say I've got issues. But uh, <laughs> sometimes it isn't all about you. Sometimes uh, the S and RSVP is service through listening, being vigilant and being present, um, holding the space that you hold. And sometimes we are asked to be a human being and not a human doing, that our, that our mere presence is enough. It's good enough. It's more than good enough. That's a hard lesson to, to imagine, and, and it's sometimes it, it is also about listening without blame or judgment. The, the, the uh, St. Ignatius Loyola, uh, 
who is the founder of the Society of Jesus, where I've been hanging out for 15 years with the Black Robes. I mean, there's some people that know a little about a lot, and there's others that know a lot about a little. And these brothers, I'm here to say, know a lot about a lot. And uh, one of the things that they know a lot about is the power of reflection, and also uh, this principle of presupposition. And it goes like this, how do you listen to the other? And you listen to the other so much that you save their truth for them. How many of us do that? That is true service, listening without blame or judgment, being open to outcome, not attached to outcome. An incredible gift to the divinity within whoever the other is sitting across the table from us. Incredible to be able to listen with, with that sort of discipline, to be able to bracket and suspend our own uh, preconceived notions. Because we all have PhDs in criticism, right? Our self-talk is always looking at the other in a different way. I guess what we're called to do when we listen that way is very similar to what Anthony DeMello suggests, and that is that rain falls on both sinners and saints. Is it possible for a rose to say, I will give my fragrance to the good people who smell me, but I withhold it from the bad? Or is it possible for the lights in this auditorium to say, I will shine and share my light with the good people in this room, and for those that are evil, I will leave them in darkness? Is it possible for a tree on a hot, sunny day to say, I will share my shade with those that are good, and I withhold my shade from those that are evil or bad? These are images of what love is about. These are images of service born from the spirit of love. Let's go on to V. V, RSVP, is value for the principle of interdependence. Interdependence. Self-love, service to listening, and now the idea that we're all related, as many tribal people will say. We're all related. One of the most beautiful ways that I've been able to appreciate and understand this notion is Stephen Bueller in a book called One Spirit, Many People, a Manifesto for Earth Spirituality. He, he, he offers the, the following um, anecdote, quote, one of the most beautiful examples of the interlocking patterns of communication and interdependence of the earth encoded in indigenous wisdom is the old Navajo saying, if you kill off the prairie dogs, there will be no one to cry for rain. Bill Monson, who then commented about what the scientists did down in the Southwest, he says, amused scientists knowing there was no conceivable relationship between prairie dogs and rain, recommended the extermination of all ground animals, burrowing animals, in some desert areas as a way to replant the rangelands in the 1950s in order to protect the roots of the sparse desert grass. Today, the area has become virtually wasteland. You see, prairie dogs and all the creatures that dig holes open breathing tubes in the earth. As the moon circles the earth, it pulls on the underground aquifer, and it just pulls on the, just like it pulls on the, on the ocean and causes the tides. This pulls on the aquifer, the underground aquifer, causing them to rise and fall. It is akin to breathing, the breathing process in, in the human body. As the underground waters rise and fall, the earth literally breathes through the holes and gaps created by the, by the animals. The earth breathes out moisture-laden air, which helps create rain. We are all related, whether we like it or not. Six billion humanoids on this planet speaking over 6,000 languages. We're all related, whether we like it or not. You know you have relatives in your family. You have that odd uncle or aunt or cousin that just is radioactive. When you see them coming, you want to run the other way like your hair is on fire, right? Well, welcome to the human family. P, RSVP, P is for passion for forgiveness, a passion for forgiveness. And as Desmond Tutu once said, there is no future without forgiveness. Passion is a double-edged sword. It's interesting. Some of you have gone to the Passion play before. I'm going to tell two quick stories to contextualize this notion of passion being a double-edged sword. One instant happened at the Westin Hotel many, many years ago in Seattle. You know the hotel in Seattle that has the, like, the looks round, circular, conal? And uh, I... I was going to give a talk the next uh, morning, and, and I checked in around 5 o'clock. 
and I was going to the elevator to go up to my room. And when I went into the elevator, at the same time rushing were these three men that also came into the elevator. And they, I could smell, I mean, they were really happy and they smelled like liquor because it was around happy hour and they were happy. And they got in the, the, the uh, elevator with me and, and immediately started uh, getting into my stuff. You know, one of them was partially bald and said something to the effect, hey, Fred, watch out. You know, you don't got much there for him to scalp. And then the other one went off and, and started saying some things, you know, about uh, the closest casino and saying things about my braids. And, you know, and, and finally they're talking and they're talking like I'm not there. The three of them are having this conversation and, and, and they're talking about me, but I'm invisible and they're not talking to me. So finally I get a little bit irritated and say, so if you want to talk to me, I'm right here. Well, then that opens it up because then we start, you know, getting into it and mixing it up and yelling at each other and stuff. And, you know, I start exercising my mastery of uh, four-letter words and, you know, and so we start getting really hot, and, you know, and uh, so then he says something to the effect about me being a savage. Well, then I, I lose it because it, saved by the bell, the, the bell rings and the door opens and it's my floor. By that time, I'm, you know, I'm saying, you know, you want a piece of me? You know, are you, you know, I'm just uh, angry and want, just on the verge of getting real next to the guy and, and you know, wanting, wanting to mix it up with him. And then yelling at him and telling him off and got out of the elevator and flip, you know, say, read between the lines, flipping him off. And, and uh, the doors close and that's the lasting image that they have of me. Probably an angry Indian man who's violent. A couple of weeks after that, uh, I was on an airplane from uh, Portland to Spokane. And it was an airplane that was very, very, very late because it was the same day that LA was burning and it was right after the Rodney King verdict. verdict. And uh, so anyway, the airplane got there and you know, it was very, very late because uh, LA was in flames and it was smoky and all the flights were, were delayed by several hours. And so we're on the airplane and uh, people putting their stuff away and settling in and uh, there was a man behind me who um, they started talking about, he came from LA and he started talking about what was going on in LA. And at some point he said something to the effect, those damn people ought to go back where they come from, where they came from, meaning black people. And of course, I can't let that go by. So I turn around and say, and white man, where should you go back to? You know, I look at him, and he—he's he, he this stereotypical snowbird. He is—he is—he is the silver fox with with a blushed red face, and everything on him is regalia is is white. He's got a white shirt. He's got a white. He's got a white belt. He's got white pants. He's got white shoes. He's got a gold necklace around. I mean, you know, he's got a beautiful suntan. I mean, he's got gold up the yin yang, and he's like, you know, weighted material. I mean, he. So, you know, I'm thinking to myself, he, he's a Palm Springs snowbird white elite, you know, my, my stereotypes kick in, my, my tapes are going. So then he says, what do you mean? And so we get into it, we get into a heated thing, you know, and, I, and then the uh, flight attendant comes over and, you know, kind of creates an E.F. Hutton moment and says, may I help you? Because she wants to break it up, because everyone just freezes, man, and watches me and this guy just go at it, reminiscent of the scenario in the, the elevator at the Westin. So, uh, I decide to be a good boy and sit down and be quiet and look face. And um, so I do that. And the airplane takes off. It's a short flight, of course, from Portland to Spokane. But in that short flight, I, I hear voices. And no, I'm not on Heldo, Cogent, or Stelazine, or any kind of other medication. But every once in a while, I have seen things and I hear things. And um, in this instance, I heard this voice. And it said, uh, apologize to him. Forgive him. I said, what? Wait a minute. He, he's the one, not me. Apologize to him. Forgive him. So I'm working it, you know, and I'm working it, and I'm thinking, why? Why, why would I want to do that? And sometimes when I have trusted things like that, it's, it's paid off dividends immensely in terms of, here again, spiritualizing the consciousness, changing the attitude and the attention. So, so, I, so the airplane landed. And, and I, and I um, 
got my stuff off the overbend, and he was going on to Boise. This was a time when the flight went from Portland to Spokane, Spokane to Boise. And um, so he was staying on the airplane. And I, and I uh, got my stuff, and then I, I bent over the seat, you know, and got close to him. And he kind of went like this, you know. And, and I said, I am very sorry for what I said to you. That was very disrespectful of me. But I want you to know that what you said really hurt my feelings and bothered me. And I hope someday that you can understand or get an appreciation of why I reacted the way I did, although it was wrong of me. That I have to treat you the way I want to be treated. And I don't want to be treated the way I just did to you. So I'm apologizing for that. You know, and his, his face, just the muscles just relaxed on his face. And in fact, I would say that his face became illuminated. And then um, I got my stuff and started walking towards, you know, where the separation, this is a, an Alaska flight, the separation from the cattle uh, ride in the first class where the curtain is. And I turn around and I look at him and I just think from my solar plexus, I just radiate and just, just give him what I, what I know to be love, what the experience or feeling or energy of love is. And I looked at him. And I just, just beamed it to him. And he's still just looking at me. And then I turned around and left. And I've never seen that man ever again. Look at the passion imbued in both of those scenarios. In the elevator, what is the last image? The next morning when those three men wake up or whatever, the next time they see something Indian, what their, what their, what their lasting impression or stereotypical image of an Indian is going to be. And did I affirm and validate some of those stereotypes? Versus the, the man on the airplane, and what would be the lasting image of, of, for him? Created some cognitive dissonance, a disconnect. Doesn't fit in, it's not the modus operandi by which he's accustomed to. The passion to forgive. The passion to forgive. So what does it take to have a pure heart? Self-love, listening, interdependence, and forgiveness. Alice Miller's book, For Your Own Good, and I love, I love the, the title of this book. You know how sometimes it's enough just to lay there and stare at the cover of a book? You ever do that? This is one of those books. Alice Miller's book is entitled, For Your Own Good, Hidden Cruelty in Child Rearing in the Roots of Violence. And in this book, she studies the lives of such hate mongers as Hitler and their childhood experiences. And Miller's contention is that modern and postmodern era of parenting practices socializes, to, socializes us to violence and hate. No, this isn't another petition to blame parents, but it is a persuasive argument that offers one explanation of how all behavior is learned. And as I said earlier in a TV show with Tony, that in Yiddish, the word parent means first teacher. What are we teaching? When we look at the history and origin and the roots of all human conflict, they can be boiled down to the other three R's. We know that the traditional three R's are reading, writing, and arithmetic, but the three R's have become the root cause of human conflict, something that we see even as we sit here and privileged to sit here as things are happening on the other side of the world. Religion and resources. Race, religion, and resources. I could argue, as well as others, for family, that the root cause of all human conflict boils down to one of those three R's. Race, religion, or resources. Or all three, or a combination of the three. Is this the root of our nature? I think the other day I was listening to the renowned blues musician Norton Buffalo, and he uh, asks about the roots of our nature. And I would go on to talk about and say, how can we deconstruct the cycle of intergenerational trauma and dysfunction across thousands and thousands of years? The Greeks, the Babylonians, the tribal societies, all four directions, the Greeks, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, uh, the American civilization, every, every uh, Chinese, Japanese, I mean, all four directions, all the, the, the human endeavor to, to organize and orchestrate this thing called life and not be seduced by the premise of race, religion, or resources as the basis for disagreement and eventual violence and hate. 
And what I'm proposing to you is that if we have to change the three primary relationships that we have in our journey called life. Relationship to self and the other as a multicultural being, that we are all multicultural beings now, and, and that this has to do with the harmonic convergence of biology and biography. So it is this relationship fundamentally that needs to be changed to imbue it with love caring in the things that I've described earlier this evening. The second relationship is a relationship to self and the other as a spiritual being. I said earlier that, that I, am, I am a spiritual being, that the primary identifying characteristic of my existence is that I am a spirit in an earth body. I am a spirit in an earth body having physical experiences. I am not. I am not. And, and this is interesting when we go, whether it's a sweat lodge or pray with a pipe or go to mass or synagogue or temple or wherever we go to petition the Lord with prayer, to go and have sacrament with the invisible, with the divine, is it this idea that we are a uh, physical being having spiritual experiences. And it happens sometimes once a week, sometimes once a month, sometimes, if we're lucky, once a lifetime. No, wrong, flawed. I dare to argue that we, our primary identifier, is that we are spiritual beings having physical experiences. And so, my point is, the relationship to self and the other as spiritual being is what Father Spitzer talked about yesterday, and that is seeing the good news in the other. Seeing the good news in the other, and seeing people as mysteries and not problems. Seeing people as masters of their own life, composing the life, writing another chapter. And the third relationship, and this is a very, very important one, I believe, as we navigate further and deeper into the 21st century, and that is relationship to the self, relationship to self and to the earth mother, relationship to the environment. Uh, Thomas Berry's uh, notion of deep ecology, he suggests that in, 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 in this current civilization, we, we have a tendency to objectify the environment. And, and uh, you know, earth mother as object versus earth mother as subject. Many tribal societies use kinship language to identify its relationship with the environment and the earth mother. And, and therefore, what, what you have here is you have relationship with subject. When you objectify the environment or the earth mother, that gives you the raison d'etre, manifest destiny, destiny, eminent domain, to manipulate, abuse, uh, and, and ex the extraction technology, of course, is a wonderful example of that. Um, but the notion of using, objectifying, and, and what we see now today, abusing. Those are the three primary relationships that need to be changed in order to deconstruct what has been in the past the basis for human conflict, race, religion, and resources. Second question was, how does one experience spirituality as an antidote to hate? I, I want to reiterate something I said earlier, that we remember that we are hardwired for God, and that we're invi invited daily, daily invited to RSVP God. Did we get it? We need to respond with relationship, service, the value, and passion that I earlier talked about. And in and, and, and doing so, I think um, we permit this country to know its true soul in nature. And I just want to read something uh, a bit, if you humor me, uh, something that uh, Kareem McLaughlin in, uh, wrote a number of years ago. And it, and it goes like this. She says, the soul, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, I wrote some stuff in here, is that the soul of each nation holds the inner pattern of the nation's development and historical unfoldment. This includes integration of all its ethnic and racial constituencies, and I would add on sexual orientation, gender, and every human difference under the blue dome. Understanding of natural karma that needs to be resolved, the fulfillment of its higher purpose, and ultimately self-transcendence and identification with the community of nations. In the long sweep of evolution, the soul eventually illuminates and controls the personality of a nation. If not, the nation will eventually destroy itself from within, as most self-centered nations have done over the centuries, as illustrated by ancient Rome. Freedom is the innermost signature of the American soul. In fact, freedom and equality are sacred principles. The motto of our great seal, e pluribus unum, out of the many one, or unity and diversity, or unity without conformity, that we can have unity without conformity. 
Homogeneity is boring. It lowers the collective IQ. We know that. Carl Jung was once to have said this. Uh, one does not become enlightened by imaginary figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Building a multicultural democracy will require America not only to master the lessons of love and service that I've tried to outline tonight in terms of understanding the epistemology of, of, of hate by understanding the phenomenology of love, but it must confront and integrate its national shadow before the full power of its soul can flow into the national life. Revolt from all control is one aspect of the nation's shadow reflected in extreme anti-government sentiments that, that have swept across the country in various times in the history of this country. Certainly, the growth industry of hate talk radio and fanatical militias can all be interpreted as symptoms of this revolt from all control. This is really a classic case of what psychologists call shadow projection, as those groups that would most like to force their views on others and control others are most fearful that the government is going to control them. Greed and obsession with material wealth is another aspect of the U.S. shadow that needs to be confronted. The guarantee in our founding documents of the right to happiness was never meant to be totally materially defined, especially not at the expense of others. We see this issue everywhere today. We know with Enron and other examples of corporate executives raising their salaries to extravagant levels, even as thousands of workers have been laid off. And in fact, Ralph Nader was here uh, last year. He visited Spokane, in fact, here in Coeur d'Alene, too. And he spoke about the effects of globalization on the third and fourth worlds, where environmental protection, human rights, and working conditions are sacrificed for optimizing uh, capitalistic efficiencies. It's easy, it's easy for me and others, and you heard it, and you're kind of quite nauseous with it by now, about, well, what is the meaning and significance of 9-11? It was a wake-up call, a call for action to build a multicultural democracy, some who are the optimist. However, like Nietzsche, I know that all things are subject to interpretation. And whichever interpretation prevails at any given time is a function of power and not truth. Time will tell us what interpretation prevails. For now, this 9-11 call offers us an opportunity to take a fresh look at national priorities and purposes. Such crises often signal a conflict between the values of the soul and those of the personality. Perhaps we are being asked to incarnate a different understanding of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Oh, I feel better now. Is that good for you? One more thing. This was written in 1971 by Saul Holinsky. And I think it's prophetic in its insight about the American Revolution as it emerges into, I think, a democracy that's maturing or can have the potential of maturing. And let me just read this and, and listen to what he's saying, the implications, especially as we sit here tonight understanding, having a better appreciation of experiencing spirituality as antidote to hate. A quote. The human cry for the second revolution is one for meaning, a purpose for life, a cause to live for if need to be to die for. Thomas Paine's words, quote, these are the times that try men's souls, unquote, are more relevant to part two of the American Revolution than the beginning. This is literally the revolution of the soul. The great American dream that reaches out to the stars has been lost to the stripes. We have forgotten where we came from. We don't know where we are, and we fear where we may be going. Afraid, we turn from the glorious adventure of the pursuit of happiness to the pursuit of illusionary order and security stratified in a striped society. Our way of life is symbolized to the world by the stripes of military force. At home, we have made a mockery of our brother's keeper by being his jail keeper. When Americans can no longer see the stars, the times are tragic. We must believe that it is the darkness before the dawn of a beautiful new world. We must and we will see it when we believe it. We also must believe that we are quite capable 
of doing what Anthony DeMello in Awareness, the Pearls and Opportunities of Reality once said, suggested, and that we all have difficulty doing three things. And it's been my mantra for many years now, and that is we have difficulty responding to hate with love, we have difficulty including the excluded, and we have difficulty admitting we're wrong when we're wrong. They want to believe that the pure heart, like in the Lord of the Rings, can be a human doing and experiencing of spirituality, love incarnate as an antidote for hate. I also want to believe that, like Frank Fool's Crow, that we can be built of the four sacred bones, that we can have a wishbone, that we can always remember the stars and never be seduced by the stripes, by the stratification and the imposition of order that military might is the answer for all things. That we remember where we have been and where we are in relationship to the promise of who we can be. That we have that ability to dream and we invite ourselves to dream and that we also are made of the hollow bone, the hollow bone of service. Get out of the way, check your ego at the door and be able to allow the luminosity of the other side to come through us. Ceremonial practice, that hollow bone was those eagle whistles. We need to remember that we need to be like that hollow bone, to be a co worker with she, he, it, however you conceptualize to think of the divine one or the divine imagination, as William Blake once described it. There's even room for atheists, by the way, as long as they believe that they're not the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of all things. Thirdly, we need to be about the backbone, and this time, especially when things are being characterized and defined as what is considered to be patriotic, which then creates the hate and the anger and the animosity. But the idea of a backbone, to have the courage, the courage to stand up for what we believe is morally and ethically right. Backbone. And lastly, and probably most importantly, let's, let's face it, in fact, the, the Navajo uh, uh, have a celebration. I was down in the Southwest a couple of weeks ago and had the fortunate opportunity to hang out with a lot of elders from the Hopi and from the Navajo reservations. And um, they talk about how when a child laughs for the first time, it's a cause for celebration, especially when the child just laughs and giggles at something that they observe that there's some sort of irony or paradox or contradiction, and everyone is celebratory. And so the, the, the fourth bone, in addition to the wishbone, the hollow bone, and the backbone, is the funny bone. Is, is that ability to laugh and to have a sense of humor because we know the humor is what? Hue is an ancient Persian word meaning neither male or female, hue meaning God, and more, moisture, Latin, more, he more, moisture, God, God moisture, God moisture, rain for parched imaginations in these challenging times described by Thomas Paine so many, many years ago. Listen to what Joseph Pierce has to say, cracking the cosmic egg, about the importance of asking simple questions like, what do you want? What do you want? Where the mind goes, the body follows. What do you want? Do you want love or do you want hate? Quote, eternity is still in love with time. The desires arising out of time are organizing nucleus for whatever eternity might be. In every, in every case, uh, Carlos is meeting with Mosquito, the God can only ask, what do you want? Jesus promised his followers, whatever you ask in my name will be given to you. What do you want is the only question eternity can ask of time, and it is our divine gift to answer by asking our own questions. So I'll ask you, do you have any questions? What do you want? Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. You've honored me and those behind me that you cannot see. In the spirit of our ancestors, may the blessings be. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Thank you. To a certain extent, in a wonderful way. And don't get me wrong, I like my, my hot water heater and flush toilet, and I like, you know, I like all the creature comforts that contemporary society offers. And sometimes when I wax romantic about the good old days, I quickly remember, you know, that there wasn't microwaves and, you know, refrigeration and other things. But, you know, maybe there were other things that were a lot more uh, rewarding or enriching. So I, I would just like to see a balance between the two and where we can begin. You know, I don't think we've used our, our genius, our collective genius technologically to think about how we could have relationship with the earth rather than always objectifying it and, and using such things as extraction technology to get what we want 
and, and not be mindful of, of, of her. I, I think that um, you know, a lot of the, the uh, tribal ceremonies are indicative of that. Even building a sweat lodge, for example, um, in different tribes, there's 557 tribes speaking over 200 languages, and building a sweat lodge, uh, you know, I had the fortune and opportunity to do it the Northern Cheyenne way. One of my children is adopted, enrolled in Lame Deer, Montana. To make a long story short, I mean, it takes a whole day to build this, quote, simple structure because there's a lot of uh, uh, acknowledgement that you're taking something from the earth and you've got to give back. And you're giving back in prayer and you're giving back in other ways. And, and so just more balance. Uh, uh, that's part of it. The other part is um, intercultural competency or multicultural literacy has always been about uh, everyone becoming amateur anthropologists and learning about other cultures. I think it's time uh, in our journey where we begin to get to a point where we learn from other cultures, that we look at the mutuality of knowledge construction in a different way, and that the genius of other people can, can contribute to the overall uh, application of more morally and ethically, ethically of what, the ethical application of technology and, and some of the things that we have at our disposal now that other generations did not have. So I think that's, that's also what I'm talking about. But, but if you want to know more about this, Thomas Berry has done a lot of work in this thing called deep ecology. Um, and although he was excommunicated from the church, uh, Matthew Fox uh, who is a bit of an interesting person. And I think anybody who is interesting usually uh, has polarizing effects on the ones that are listening. But he wrote a book called Original Blessings and also is an advocate of what's called creation spirituality. And it can be complementary. It's not, it's not a cult. It's not new agey. It's not, well, maybe some people think it is. But there can be a, a kind of convergence, a complementary relationship between you know, Christian thought and environmentalism. Lastly, the Catholic bishops uh, in Washington state passed the pastoral letter on the Columbia River, being able once and for all to say that the church has to have a position in relationship to the environment. Next question. Anyone? Oh, over there. here. Yes. Sister Janelle. Janelle, you've been asking questions all day. <laughs> I had the pleasure of asking questions on the NIC Public Forum, and one of the things that Raymond talked about this afternoon was the franticness of our pace of life these days. Would you please comment on that for the audience? Yes, uh, and I'm, I'm really one that does that a lot. I mean, I try to live three lifetimes in one lifetime and, and uh, run at a hard pace. And So, you know, I, I think that, uh, and I use the word discipline in a liberation sense, uh, that we have to, uh, to uh, embrace a sense of discipline that uh, intentionally f forces us to slow down in, in some sort of prayer life, whether it's uh, like I work on the second floor at Gonzaga University and I'm a minute and a half away from St. Al's Church. Just, just impulsively getting up out of my desk in between meetings and walking over there and just sitting in the church maybe for five or 10 minutes or at home, uh, prayer, contemplation, meditation, song, just something that that uh, gets you in touch with the sacred and the other side. So you can hear the sweet whisper, you can hear um, what is always being told to you, but we always kind of uh, blare out. But, but it's, it's difficult to do because we, we live in overstimulated times and we, as I said, take multitasking to a new level of crazy making. And, and so it becomes more so that we do not want to be materially, quote, wealthy, but spiritually bankrupt. And I think we live in interesting times where we can creatively synergize the best of both worlds to optimize the best, best of what the spirit world can offer and what the earth mother can offer. And I, that, that is a responsibility that we all have. I, I think that, that I earlier intimated about democracy and what its true meaning was to this country and its founding. And I think that we're free so we can spiritually evolve and unfold. Uh, unlike any other country in any other time in the history of this planet, we are uniquely positioned to be able to leverage our freedom, our liberation, for spiritual enfoldment and evolution. And, and, and as such, that, that requires some responsibility. Many of you have heard me speak before, and I've often talked about how and, and, uh, uh, that we have a Statue of Liberty on the East Coast, and we should have a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast to kind of bring that balance between uh, what we have been given and blessed and endowed with, and also the responsibility 
uh, an expectation. And part of that is to slow down and, and, and to be able to do that. Now, people, you know, like Father Spitzer says, the humanoid has an infinite capacity to rationalize anything and, and everything, and, and very eloquently at that, um, and seductive at times. But I think that we need to seduce ourselves to the silence. It is what the Desert Fathers once talked about, is that in solitude we midwife the human being. We are born in solitude. It is when you quiet yourself down and, and you can find the fire within. What is your passion? How, what, is, what is the wind in your sail? You know, Hans Selye said, no wind favors him who has no destined port. What is it about you that, that gets you up in the morning, your passion? What do you believe in? What is it? You, you can only, you say that you describe the human spirit as a flame, or sometimes it is just an amber that we have to use the breath of life to bring it back. But it is, it is in that breath that we bring it back. And, and so uh, prayer, contemplation, meditation, slowing down, going for a run, it doesn't have to be this you know, heavy, deep, in real time. I mean, we can create teachable moments with the sacred and the beloved in other ways. I mean, I'm a runner. Sometimes I, I have the most fascinating conversations with God when I'm running or when I'm riding a bike, or when I'm, uh, when I'm teaching sometimes, it happens. You know? So what, where, what, what is your passion? What um, wind in your sail? What is that? You know, I often believe we're like, uh, and, and allow God to breathe on us, because we're like dandelions in a way. You know, the, the down. I saw my first dandelion the other day, and my first buttercup, and I thought, the, insist, the, the insistent breath of God blowing us around. Like that paper in that movie some time ago. What was it? it, it what was that movie that had that piece of paper and it was just floating around? Do you remember that? There have been, yeah, many movies like that. What, what, what is that invisible, that, 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 that embrace that, that, that propels you daily? And you can only get in touch with that energy and that power if you slow down and invite it. See, God has good manners. She, he, it won't, won't come unless you're in, you invite. Because there's a principle in the universe, and it's called the principle of non-interference. Non God cannot come, she, he, or it, unless you invite. And the invitation occurs when we are in prayer or in ceremony, or in singing, or in some cases in relationship. We have to help each other. Common unity, what, what would be our common ground? To have common unity, you have to have common ground. And so we have to help each other with the commons to slow each other down, to do things. And let's not forget, when we talked earlier today about joy, having the rapture of being alive, to give ourselves permission to play. I, I know I'm, I'm pretty obsessive, compulsive, and a workaholic because it's mood altering. We live in a mood altering society and sometimes got to slow down not to, to not mood alter anymore. And as I said earlier, to feel. You cannot heal what you do not feel. And I'm one to say that I teach what I need to learn the most, by the way. I'm up here sharing with you things that you don't know the story behind the story. But, but, but I am trying to learn these things. And sometimes they say you teach what you need to learn the most. Form of self-love is to slow down and be with your God and develop your faith life. That is, a, that is the greater glory of God. And also gives us permission to see, as the Jesuits say and suggest, the active presence of God in all things. The active presence of God in all things that we don't become autistic and blind to what is abundant. We do indeed live in the land of plenty. There is no doubt. We live in the land of plenty. But how often do we walk around like life is a... The mafia got me, man, and they put cement boots on my feet, and they're going to throw me off the Monroe Street Bridge. You know, life is a hassle, it's a pain. But understand the principle of love that, that says to serve life out of gratitude for the gift of life, to serve life for the gratitude of gift of life. We can't understand the idea that life indeed is a gift, that we incarnate that sense of knowingness that it indeed is a gift with the attitude of gratitude and then do something with that sense of graciousness by acting in service to life. We can't do any of that and connect the dots in some uh, coherent way unless we slow down and go through what the Platonics called the fertile void. Here again, solitude, the desert fathers. 
where truly human beings are born. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let's once again thank uh, Dr. Raymond Reyes. Thank you. And, and join us again tomorrow. We have a big full day tomorrow. <laughs>